top intro. We're going to try to wake up the audience a little bit and uh, cover some things very quickly. Excuse me for the English, but if I've got to speak really fast, which I have to, better in my mother tongue. Um, we're really here about convergence and the convergence of the social and the entrepreneur. And it used to be that these two terms were antithetical, were in opposition to each other. That if you were social, you therefore had nothing to do with business. Or if you're an entrepreneur, you're about making money and you weren't social. But today, this doesn't make any sense anymore. If you're going to make money, you're going to have to address social big problems. If you're going to be social, you've got to think about how your business model is going to be sustainable. How are you going to, in many cases, make money? And if you look at what we're about at the moment is trying to get behind what I call the, the mirrored room of the privileged. One of the great advantages we have here in Israel is that we're very connected globally. And if you look at the startups that come from Silicon Valley, they are, in my opinion, looking in a room full of mirrors. They're solving problems for themselves and for people like them. Very often it has spillover effects. One can't argue that Facebook and Twitter have had impacts around the world positive impacts in terms of democratization and whatnot. But on the other hand, they're not deeply engaged in what's going on in Africa or what's going on in developing economies and agriculture in Asia, the stuff we heard from LR. And this is a huge advantage to us. Okay, on the other hand, but being social does not mean accepting second-rate businesses. I don't countenance any of this talk of, well, you know, you can have a, a business for profit, but don't make too much profit. Bullshit. Make as much profit as you can, okay? What's wrong with profit? Profit's good, okay? And if people are trying to brainwash you that somehow capitalism is a negative element in this, then they're wrong, okay? Because this is about combining the best and the energy of the private sector and making money while at the same time doing social good. So no modest ROIs, please, okay? Hit it out of the park. Um, what I looked at is not a double bottom line, but a triple bottom line. Profits, real businesses with huge profits, people, i.e. in particular here driving economic growth, employment here in Israel, and inclusion into this circle, and the planet. How do we solve social problems via businesses that really affect all three? So you've got a triple bottom line. None of these can be sacrificed especially the profits can't be sacrificed. So I'm gonna put up a slide of a company which I wish I had invested in, but I didn't, called Mobileye. And most of you say, wait a minute, Mobileye, what does this have to do with social entrepreneurship? But it's a classic case of the triple bottom line. Here's a company that's made huge you know, money for its investors and soon will be turning huge profits in general, employing tons of people in Jerusalem and in Israel. And on the third hand, it's saving lives. What is more social than stopping car accidents? Okay, but literally saving lives, it's a perfect example. And here they get the profits. They go to NASDAQ, $5 billion company. And by the way, Amnon Shashu is back again doing it another time with Orcam, which is going to let the blind see. Okay, but again, doing it on a for-profit business. You know, you look at what's going on in the kibbutzim today. It's, it's just incredible. The kibbutzim are making tons of money. Right? They're the original social startups in this country, okay? But it's only fitting now that kibbutzim like Afikim or Sasa or uh, Sdot Yam, they're now getting filthy rich, okay? Do you know how successful Caesar Stone is or Afi Milk, which is now selling hundreds of millions of dollars into China and India, okay? Or Plasan up in, in Sasa? Again, showing that you can be both social and even own it collectively and create huge profits and huge businesses. If you look at what's going on in the ag tech, you heard earlier from LR, watch this company, Kaima. Again, not in my portfolio, it's outside of it. These guys are changing yields on basic foodstuffs like maize and corn and wheat, increasing yields by up to 30% without using GMO. It's gonna be a great company in my opinion. We have our own champion, okay, a company called Rewalk, which I mentioned earlier this morning. This company, basically allows people who are confined to a wheelchair to walk again. Okay, what a wonderful, great thing. It was founded by a quadriplegic, who by the way is back at it again with a new company called Up and Ride. And yet this company is, you know, went public, made the investors money, and it's a combination of this triple bottom line. 
So if you, I want to talk a little bit about how crowdfunding can play a role here. And most people think of crowdfunding, and they think of Kickstarter, basically it's a donation, okay, or a what's called reward-based. What's the reward? A t-shirt. So the most famous, you know, sites are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. There are people doing peer-to-peer -peer lending, like Lending Club and Prosper. But the, the real sort of iconic big boom came with this little company called Pebble, who came out with a really cool watch, and $10 million later from backers on Kickstarter, they started their business. Another example was this company called Oculus. You might have heard about it. A guy named Palmer Lucky. Believe it or not, his name is Mr. Lucky. And he raised $2.5 million on Kickstarter to build these great virtual reality glasses. Except something happened about two years later to Mr. Lucky. He got really lucky and he sold the company for $2 billion to Facebook. Except what about the guys who actually backed him? The people who, who did this because they wanted to create this brave new world of virtual reality with all the great impact. What did they get? They got a lousy t-shirt. The guy didn't even invite them to Maui to party or to Necker Island with Richard Branson, something. But the guy made billions of dollars and they got the t-shirt. Actually, he did us a huge favor because ever since this is happening, people are talking and talking and saying, is there another way to crowdfund stuff and to get part of this multiple bottom line, how do I get lucky? And the answer is equity crowdfunding, where you can back people like some of those companies you've seen today, and you can not only help them do good in the world, but you can make money. That's exactly the point. You create this multiple bottom line. And so it turns out we started this in Israel because we thought it would be a cool way to connect investors from around the world who wanted to connect to Startup Nation, and something happened, and today we are the biggest crowdfunding for equity platform in the world. We've crossed $100 million. We're celebrating our second year anniversary, so we've been doing this for two years. We're up to 60 companies, and we're just getting started. Uh, we have now 7,000 investors who are hooked up, and they're all accredited investors, people who have means. They have to be Kishiri um, and You know, I can spend more time talking about our crowd. I'm not going to do it. Uh, we, one of the things we do differently than the normal crowdfunding sites is that we curate the whole process. Because it's investment and because the minimum investment is $10,000, we make sure that we select the companies that go up. You can't just go to our crowd and put your company up. Every week or so we're doing a new deal. Sometimes we're doing two deals a week. And then we actually you know, sign term sheets just like venture capitalists, due diligence and whatnot. We do a pretty good job, I think. We select the company, we negotiate the terms, and then we offer it to the crowd of investors for them to invest their $10,000. One of the things which is interesting about our business now is that we're actually investing millions of dollars per company. We just announced that we led a round in a company um, where we invested $6 million from the crowd. So this is no longer just 100 grand or 200 grand. You can actually invest real money. So, we look at it as sort of a blend between angel investing and venture capital. You get the freedom of being an angel and the professionalism of venture capital. You get all the, the check boxes uh, clicked. I'm happy to share these slides if someone would like them. I'm going to go through them quickly. So we were a hybrid, really, of venture capital and crowdfunding. We look at these thousands of companies. We research them, select the best. We invest, by the way, our own money in every single deal that we do. We put our own capital to work, and then we open the deals to the crowd and the stats have been good and they continue to get better. We're very proud of the fact that we've got 110 countries represented on the platform. We're truly global, and we're not just global in terms of investment, but we're now starting to invest around the world. And we're very proud of the fact that not only are we backing Israeli companies primarily, but we're starting from Israel to provide a democratization of this kind of innovation finance all around the world. And I like the guys who are talking about boycotts and BDS and all that other bullshit to choke on it. Okay, they can watch Israel start funding the rest of the world through crowdfunding. Okay, boycott that. Okay, and we'll see how that works. Um, why does crowdfunding work for social ventures? Okay, well, first of all, the crowd loves a story. If you put something up there which has got passion and dreams and hope, the crowd responds to it. Also, you got to get emotion and salience. People have to, to feel, have to be heat. Okay, if it's too boring and too dry, it might make a good investment. It's not going to work on a crowdfunding site. And then many crowds can form around all kinds of markets, like Parkinson's, 
or fibroid tumors, because there turns out there are millions of people in the world who are interested in these and thousands of investors. So you can actually create these sort of niche markets. You can choose what you love and what motivates you. And we think that crowdfunding is going to break up this monopoly. I wish that Cajlon would hear this. Okay, the bottom line is that venture capital has been the ultimate monopoly. Right? I can tell you this because I was a monopolist. I was a venture capitalist. I managed hundreds of millions of dollars. And basically, it was me and my three or four partners. You sit around and you decide who gets the money and who doesn't. Now, you have some competition. Sure, there's the venture capital fund down the road. Basically, it's all you know, concentrated, certainly in Silicon Valley around Sand Hill Road. But if you're outside of Israel or Silicon Valley, excuse me, you're screwed. If you're in Cleveland, Ohio, forget about it. We invested in a company on our crowd from Cleveland. Great company. I'll show it to you in a second. And when they called the venture capitalists, they started really getting excited on the phone calls. And then they said, well, where are you guys located? And they said, Cleveland. Eh, the gong went off. Because which VC is going to fly to Cleveland? Excuse me. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is great. Not great enough. Okay? And these people don't go. So all of a sudden, through crowdfunding, you can actually democratize this bring in lots of new investors. It turns out that even at our level, which is accredited investors only, there are 10 million households that meet this criteria in America. Of this 10 million, about 100,000 have invested as angels until now, less than 1%. So we're now stopping that 1% from being the monopolists or the venture capitalists, and we're bringing in the rest of that 10 million in America and tens of millions of accredited investors worldwide. Someday this will open up to everybody. Someday the regulators will figure out how I don't go to jail if I take $100 or $200. But in the meantime, you have to be a cashier investor in this country or the US. Our minimum is $10,000. But we think this is going to flatten the global innovation world. And the most important part of what we're trying to do is to harness the power of the crowd. I liked very much uh, what the gentleman from ANU was talking about, because this mobilizing the crowd is critical because we're not just about funding these companies, but about using the crowd to push them forward. First of all, to help us select and to diligence the companies at a crowd level, but number two, to get everybody involved in helping to make connections and to drive the business development and the funding forward as a huge crowd. And that becomes a, really an unassailable uh, differentiation, which will be very good for our companies. So, my friend Saul Singer wrote the book Startup Nation. He's been walking around and, and flying around a lot lately, saying, we need some new problems to solve. And basically what he's saying is that we've got to get beyond this just solving the problems of the privileged. We have to focus on new markets. We have to serve the needs of the other 5 billion people on the planet who are still developing. We've got to focus on markets in Africa, and Asia, and South America, about disabilities, about how to democratize and reform the world of finance, the environment, energy, medical devices. These are all going to be very, very big markets, lucrative markets, where we can make profits and also do good. Our portfolio continues to grow. I'm going to tell you a few stories about our own triple uh, bottom line companies, and I'm going to wrap it up. So Rewalk, again, is a company founded by a uh, quadriplegic, Amit Gofair, just change the world, okay? Letting people walk again. Uh, Sio is a company you might, you know, be hearing a lot about who are making a little scanner, and you might say, well, wait, why is this Google for all matter going to be social? Because guess what? If you've got a peanut allergy or gluten allergy, or if you're buying antibiotics, which are fake, you'll be able to take Sio and actually prevent that from happening. It's going to change the world, in my opinion. Um, Surgical Theater is that company in Cleveland. Some flight simulation guys who got together with brain surgeons saying, wouldn't you like to take a trip into the brain before you cut the guy open? It's a good idea. Uh, BT9 is doing food security. They're measuring temperature and humidity across the food chain. Would you believe that half of the world's food is wasted in the cold chain, the perishable products, from production to plate. Half of the world's food is wasted. This company is solving that problem. Variegate, which has just been renamed to CropX, is using smartphone apps to save water and improve yields in developing countries. Site Diagnostics is doing a whole game-changing technology in malaria testing, bringing a standard test down from an hour to two minutes or from three bucks to 10 cents. Abe's Market's a leading site for e-commerce for organic products. And you go on and on and on. 
There are companies uh, that, uh, Evigilo is a company doing emergency alerts here in this country for missiles. They've now taken it to Chile and other countries to alert for tsunami and earthquakes. We have companies like Inverid who are saving electricity in uh, big air conditioning systems. Neverware, who are changing the way that education is working. Metaware, not a cousin, just sounds alike, uh, who are changing the way that prescriptions are being written so people don't get killed in hospitals. We talked about that this morning. Okay, and you, just basically, I would say that half of our portfolio today, and I'm gonna have to stop at this point, okay, are companies that are doing that triple bottom line. We're co-investing with a bunch of really great people, people like Peter Thiel or Eric Schmidt or Mort Meyerson. These are leaders in the, in the area, so we're not just doing sort of oddball deals. We're also co-investing with leading venture capital funds, funds like Excel or Index, Battery and Bessemer, Canaan Partners, all the big guys are working with us and allowing you as an individual to actually invest on the same terms in the same kinds of companies. We're co-investing with big corporations like General Electric, who all of a sudden recognize that, hey, we want to be considered part of the crowd as well. I think just a couple of words, and I'm going to take a little bit more time, and just two more minutes, because of this, some things that were said this morning. Um, I want to talk about capitalism, okay? I think that, you know, we've heard a lot of criticism about capitalism, and I think that we have to understand, especially given our roots, I mean, this country started off its life as a socialist system, and we know what it was like if you didn't have that, you know, Cartes uh, Javert, okay? And we know what it was like when the economy charged people taxes for 60 or 70 percent if they built a profit-seeking uh, uh, operation. We know what it was like to be overregulated, okay? Business is not inherently evil. Profits are not evil. Entrepreneurs like Gil Schwade or Shlomo Kramer or Yossi Vardy, they're not tycoons. Okay, people who are creating yesh ma'ayin are creating great things, are actually, in my opinion, partners with Hashem, with God. Because when you're talking about building a new company, what you're doing actually is doing the highest form of tzedakah. The Rambam in his Hilchot, I mean, I'll take after Avi Katz today, who gave like a shiur Torah, it was beautiful. But the Rambam said that, you know, to give money to somebody directly is a good form of charity. To give it beseter, you know, uh, anonymously is even better. But to give somebody a job, that's the highest form. So these people who are creating these great companies, they're not just tycoons. Capitalism is a great engine that can move us forward. And if we fail to realize how good we've got it, right, there's lots to fix here. There's lots to fix. But you don't want to go the route of Greece and Spain and France. Today, in Spain and Greece, 40% of the people under the age of 30 are unemployed. 40% are unemployed. Our unemployment is now at an all-time low, 5%. Okay, we don't want to go backwards to socialism. We want to go forward to a humane capitalism, to a capitalism which will actually increase our high-tech investment. We went up 46% last year. When I heard this thing about the fact that we're in a no-growth economy, I wanted to puke. It's complete crap. The reality is that in this country over the last five years, we have had six times the average growth of the OECD. Six times. Okay, the, any OECD country would be proud to have our growth rate. The investment last year went up 46% in high tech. Don't let people lie, okay, and believe that stuff, that somehow this economy is stopped and dead. Because the heart of it, the high tech economy is growing and growing ferociously, in my opinion. Look at what's going on in NASDAQ. Look at what's going on in the M&A exits. Look at the size of our exits growing. And you're saying, well, that's only for the rich people. It's not true. Because the people who are building these companies need buildings built in Airport City in Kiryat Atidim. They need drivers. They need food service. They need insurance people. They need the whole system. And so this is what's driving our economy forward. Please, let's not stop it. Thank you very much.